Hello, Dolphins fans, haters, and everyone in between to your favorite show discussing the greatest franchise in sports, the Miami Dolphins. My name is Moose, your host, and today I'm super excited to get going as we talk about Tua getting the nod to take over as the starter for the Dolphins, you know, what the team should focus on in the bye week, as well as what to expect in the second half of the season now that we got the new gunslinger in there. As always, we'll also take a quick look at the latest stories that were published over at finspod.com. Let's dive in. And a big ovation as Tua Tungabailoa trucks on the field for the first time. Hardly anyone in this building, but it's still loud. Even Fitz is leading the ovation. You know, there were obviously no preseason games, so you didn't get a chance to see him during the preseason. It's be your first time to see him hand the ball off. That's exactly what he does. Oh, he looked good doing it, too. So the Dolphins made the announcement, well, when I say made the announcement, Adam Schefter leaked it to everybody, that the Dolphins would be going with Tua come next Sunday against the Rams. The fifth overall pick will be starting coming out of the bye, which was a surprise to pretty much everyone, not just the national media, which (laughs) we'll get into that. They really took that as a surprise. But it also was a shock to even Dolphins fans and and the local media who covers the team every single day. You know, at at this point in the season, it's important to assess where the team is at right now, you know, before trying to figure out why it is that the Dolphins went with Tua here. You know, the Dolphins started off the season with a tough matchup against the Patriots. You know, Fitzpatrick was definitely the right option at that point in time. Tua had just come in with the offseason the way it was, you know, with the whole COVID restriction and all those protocols that were being, you know, used at the time. There was no there was no way a rookie could get into a new NFL system, learn the offense, gel with his teammates, you know, gel with the offense at large, work with the coordinator and step in in that much faster paced game speed and just be fine. That, that you know, that's that's not really going to work, especially one coming out of injury. Now, you could argue that Joe Burrow, it's working great, right? Joe Burrow's looking amazing. You know, Justin Herbert, oh my God, look at them. They're, they're so good. What's happening right now? They're getting beat up physically, and their teams are still losing. So the fact that that's happening should tell you that it was a smart idea that to let Fitz take that beating. First six games, while this team sort of figured itself out and you know determined what it would be going forward, it was Fitzpatrick back there who sort of steadied the ship and made sure everything was rolling the way it should, You know, doing you know sort of what the offense, he, he he was a great asset to this team you know in terms of his leadership but in all honesty there was a ceiling in terms of talent you know he at, at a certain point you have to pull the plug here so you know I sort of understand what Flores is doing um, and, and when you again just look at the season the first game against the Patriots tough matchup no film on cam and that whole new you know <laughs> offense that they had you know it's a little excusable to lose that game you know considering that that is a contending team well, maybe not anymore, you know, and then they lost to the Bills and, and they just lost to the Bills by three. Um, it was a close game. They didn't have Byron Jones. He left the game very early. You know, they had the lead going in the fourth quarter. And frankly, there was some defensive miscommunications, which really, really, you know, forced a loss there. You know, then on Thursday night on a short week with the season on the line, they beat the Jaguars. They, they beat down the Jaguars. Fitz looked great, but the Jaguars, you know, were absolutely smothered by the Dolphins defense. And the, the plays that Fitz were making were not like unique plays. That's the important thing here. Yes, the team was, you know, moving the ball down the field, but it wasn't like Fitzpatrick was doing things that no quarterback could do. If Tua is what you expect in a fifth overall pick, he should be able to do those exact same things. And if not, way more. And at that, you know, if that's the case, if your team's looking to contend, why would you not put him in? Why would you not put him in? So following that game to the Jaguars, you know, a perfect example of why Tua might be a good option, they went to Seattle. And although the the team looked good, that the, the person who held them back, frankly, in that game was Ryan Fitzpatrick. The red zone offense cost them that game. They the defense kept them in it to a degree that almost no team has against the undefeated Seahawks at this point. So the fact that, you know, the Dolphins were in it, the team was in it, and the person holding them back was a quarterback, you know, as great as Fitz has been, that should tell you that this team is kind of ready to take a step. And if Tua is that step, then or at least follows along, you know, in terms of the talent there, this team should be able to take, you know, some leaps and bounds going forward and make be a playoff team. 
Um, and that's sort of what I think Flores is going through. And, you know, it, the, you know, the beatdown of the 49ers and the scheme and sort of the game plan and, and with the Jets to hold them to zero points. I mean, that, that just shows some good coaching. And if, if the good if the coaching's there, then have trust in the decisions that, that they're going to make. You know, the team, you know, has been on a roll and uh, for the first time in a long time. We're sitting at 500, you know, all things considered, it, great situation. So why, why would Flores put Tua in? I mean, there's one, only one reason, and I think we've already talked about it, and it's that Tua is balling. In practice, in, in meetings, he, he's clearly you know on the sidelines when they're, they're going over the iPad or the Microsoft Surface or whatever the hell it is these days, and they're looking at it, and they're talking it over, and he's sitting there with the quarterback's coach, and he's talking to him. He's clearly answering every question right. He knows where to put the ball. He sees the coverages. He's identifying what he needs to you know, pre- and post-snap. If that's happening then why would you not put him in? His footwork's significantly better. He's got a better arm. He's more mobile. What's the, why do you take him if you're not going to play the guy? And it's not like it's not like he's still recovering from that injury. He was off the injury report after week two. He's healthy. If he's healthy and better, play him. You know, this is not Fitz and Rosen. This is this is Fitz and Tua. And, and if you're going to take Tua fifth overall when you have Fitz and Rosen on your roster, it does say something about Fitz and Rosen. I think that's kind of getting lost here. As great as Fitz has been, as sad as that press conference was, this is the right move. There was a deficiency in the offense, and, and frankly, that deficiency was red, red zone execution, making plays when it was tough, third and longs, things along those lines. You know, the, the offense would sputter in the second half. When the run game wasn't there, the offense struggled. And I know that's a generality. A lot of offenses struggle. But the goal is to have a guy who can make the offense work just by himself. Um, so at that point in time, you have to, you know, get your quarterback in there of the future and, and see see what you got. So going forward, you know, Miami's in a bye week right now. And obviously a lot of the attention's on Tua. But it's also important to see you know, where the team is, sort of assess what's been working, what hasn't been working, you know, and, and I, you know, just to look at some of the favorable things that the Dolphins have been able, able to do in the first half of the season that they should definitely, you know, keep as part of their offense and defensive game plans. Starting on the offense, you know, running the ball with Miles Gaskins. Miles Gaskin has been an amazing, you know, surprise. The, you know, Dolphins signed Jordan Howard. They trade for Matt Breida. Those veterans with a lot of experience with explosive plays on their resume, I think a lot of fans assumed that they were the ones who would get the majority of the reps, the bulk of the reps. And all of a sudden, a seventh-round pick last year, someone who was behind Patrick Laird on the depth chart, you know, out of I believe out of uh, out of Washington, correct? Yeah, out of Washington. He he's the one who's carrying the load, and he looks pretty good. He's dynamic. He he hits the right hole. Um, he he runs north south. He's not dancing too much. He gets the yards that are there. You know, is he the best running back over the last few years the Dolphins have had? Probably not. <clears throat> But he f- sort of fits that, you know, Dion Lewis sort of Patriots, Rex Burkhead style, um, James White style of running back that, you know, the Patriots liked and Brian Flores is used to, um, rather than that, you know, classic Jordan Howard, give the ball to 20, 25 times a game, downhill running, you know, sort of beat up the defense over time. You know, you go with a guy who can help in, in the passing game as well. Um, and, and so that's definitely been a, a good thing. And I think the Dolphins should keep on leaning on him going forward. You know, they also should continue to take advantage of those favorable matchups that they're finding and, and, and the three blowout wins you saw them do, you know, whether it be Gasicki on, on a slower linebacker or smaller safety, just sort of just outbodying him, using his great hands to, to reel in pretty much any pass and definitely lean on him more so in the red zone. They, they haven't really used him as much as we would like to see um, in that in the red area. Parker. He, you know, on any outmatched corner, which at this rate is a lot of corners, you know, make finding those matchups, those one on one opportunities. And I think Tua definitely, you know, can, can utilize Parker and Preston Williams on the outside, you know, with their size and sort of positioning. Um, you know, if you put the ball where it needs to be, where the defender can't get it, you know, you might not hit all the time, but you're not going to have sort of costly turnovers. It's either your guy gets it or nobody gets it. And I think with Fitz, a lot of times those deep throws, those risky 50-50 balls, that's what they were. They were 50-50 balls. I think Tua makes it more like an 80-20 ball. Uh, so that's definitely something to look forward to. Um, and also with Tua, sort of the, the utilization of the quick passing game, you know, the screen game, seeing Miles Gaskin and <clears throat> Matt Breida sort of being used a little bit more in the passing game, that's definitely something that we would want to see going forward.
Now, if we're trying to figure out what the offense is going to look like generally, you know, a lot of people, um, a lot of different, you know, Dolphins prognosticators out there think the RPO is what's going to be used. I, you know, I do see that sort of, you know, run play, run pass options. But you know, when in term, when people hear run pass option, they're they're thinking two is running. I I really don't think that's going to happen. They're going to try to keep them out of harm's way. You know, occasionally maybe in the red zone. You know, third and short. They'll probably pull that out of the pull that out of their hats, but you know, as part of as a staple of the offense, I, I highly doubt that. I think it'll be more of that triple option, um, you know, type of offense where Tua reads the outside linebacker, the Mike linebacker, whoever it is, he's reading on that play the end, and if if he you know hands it off to Miles Gaston on the inside, try to run it up the middle, or he sort of tries to fake it, maybe there's an opening for him to gain some yardage for a quick run, or the likely alternative, he just whips it out for a quick pass, or someone's going for a slant, sort of what he did at. Alabama. Alabama, that, that quick passing attack, you know, using space. Um, you know, there was a cool um, stat that, that went around that showed up out of all 32 teams. The Dolphins offense was the most, you know, horizontal, um, as in we spaced it out um, the most in the league. And, and what that shows is that the team uses spacing and, and, and sort of uses the zones against them, you know, and defensive coverages against themselves to find openings. And I think Tua's shown at Alabama that that's exactly what he does. And I think the Dolphins have clearly catered an offense to that. So, you know, there will likely be a lot of, you know, leaning a lot on the run game, trying to establish that, you know, help Tua out in that regard. But I think the you'll you'll also see a lot of sort of deep shots to sort of space things out and open open everything up. So it's definitely going to be exciting to see how the offense looks heading into the second half of the season. Now, defensively, you know, at the bye at this point in time, you know, I would say the number one thing is get healthy. A couple of the linebackers, you know, Van Ginkle, Grugier Hill, um, they got banged up. Um, Kyle Van Noy was is battling, I believe it was a groin injury. So I think getting healthy is important. Overall, there seems to be some clear cohesion and way less, you know, miscommunication. As we mentioned earlier in the show, you know, thinking back to Buffalo, there were some horrible errors in the secondary, some blown coverages, defenders not knowing where their help is. It, it was just a mess. You know, and the front seven was not carrying their weight either. You know, but after that game, after Noah Igbenogany got roasted a few times and Stefan Diggs tore out every Dolphins fan's heart. The defense just started to improve. You know, there was clear, com- you know, communication improvement. The secondary, you know, knew where their help was. There was less busted coverages where you'd see, you know, tight end slot receivers sort of just running across the middle of the field wide open. You know, overall, the defensive direction, it looks good. So, you know, this bye week, just stay healthy and, and continue to play to your strengths. Use Eric Rowe as a tight end neutralizer and, you know, keep those corners on the outside and man and sort of allow your linebackers to make plays and, and, and create pressure. So overall, the way the defense has been looking and the direction it's going under Flores, um, definitely something, you know, definitely something to to be excited about. So what can we expect out of the Dolphins in the second half of the season? You know, it's going to look completely different than the first half now that, you know, the face of the franchise has been thrown in there. You know, but but this can go a multitude of different ways. You know, Tua can perform below average. He can struggle. He is a rookie. You know, he is coming off of an injury. He hasn't been tackled yet. You know, he could struggle. And, and it's not just struggle in that first game against the Rams. He could struggle going down the line against the Chargers, you know, against the, the Bills, the Jets. You know, he might struggle the rest of the season. Um and that, you know, that is concerning and due to his star, star power, it could be tough to endure. You might start seeing some to a slander should the Dolphins use the Houston pick on, you know, Fields or or you know, Trey Lance, you know, consider moving up for her, for Lawrence. That, you know, that is a realistic thing to expect if Tua does struggle, you know, but. <laughs> that's not likely, all things considered. I don't think that's going to happen. I think a lot of the people don't think that's going to happen, whether it be you know people who've watched him play throughout his career at Alabama, um, people who've known him, the you know Trent Dilfer types, people who you know in the organization have been talking so highly of him. Recently, Jerome Baker spoke about it. You know, here's a quick clip of of him talking about what you know what they've seen in Tua. Uh, the next person I text was Tua. Uh, you know, just watching him these past few weeks, these past few months, um, you're just so proud of him. Uh, just how he carried himself, how he practiced, how he go about learning, how he asks questions, not just questions on the offensive end, but defensive players, um, how he works. Uh, you, you just happy for guys like that to get the opportunity, and uh, he's definitely going to do well. I'm definitely uh, proud of him. So you can tell just by the way he's talking about it, you know, people are excited to see what he has to work with. So 
I have a feeling that the team's not going to be worse off. They might not be better, but he probably won't struggle to that degree. So sort of talking about being at the same level, he could be playing at the same level as Ryan Fitzpatrick, managing the game, making some throws here or there, you know, but never taking the reins on a consistent and long-term basis. He doesn't play, you know, he, he shows flashes and sparks of great brilliance and, you know, but it's not really strung along and the team loses some close games, you know, or what we hope could happen. And, and he is for real that all that hype, you know, sort of the legend of Tua, all that stuff, it's legit. And he sort of like Burrow, he goes in there and takes command of, of a team. The difference between him and Burrow is the team he's taking command of has shown that they can win and that they're already pretty strong. So, you know, if if that comes, if, you know, if that's the case, he'll he'll come in and elevate, you know, the already solid play of all those around him, you know, whether it be the Miles Gaskin, the Devontae Parker, you know, whether it be on defensively complementing the way that the defense is going and actually, you know, taking what you get, you know, rather than feel just field goals, scoring when your defense puts you in, in, in a good position. Um, so in that case, you know, we'll definitely have a really fun ride ahead, you know, and, and personally, I think the way this season's going to go, I mean, let me know, you know, over at Finspot on Twitter. Um, you know, just just let me know what you guys think the second half is going to look like. But it, it does get easier, and I think the defense has finally sort of figured out what they are. And, and I think Brian Flores has a good grasp of, of sort of game planning and, and what his strengths of his team are. So I, I think we're going to be in pretty much every game. I mean, anyone who sort of watched the team since, you know, last season, since they sort of started picking it up over those last nine games, you know, even coming into this season, aside from that Patriots game where they kind of didn't look like they were on the same page and there was there was just some communication issues. Since that, though, the team has just consistently gotten better. Um, and, and I don't see why that would stop. And, and even if they don't get better and they stay at this level, that's still a competitive level. Um, I think that they can get better. Um, and now that two is in there, I think it opens up a lot of different things. And just lastly, just taking a look at what, you know, was published over at finspod.com, see what the guys got cooking over there. Um, you know, of course, there wasn't a lot of news this week. It was pretty, dr- yeah, of course not. It was Tua. Everything was Tua. We already touched base about it. Feel free to go over to finspod.com and, and read the content there. It's a, it's a good read, sort of a different perspective on, you know, what it is we've been talking about with him. Um, the other thing that did happen this week is the Dolphins, you know, following the injury of Devon Godchow, um, you know, they're, they're looking for some depth there. You know, although they do have, you know, Raekwon Davis um, and Christian Wilkins and Zach Sealer, you know, you just need some more bodies. Um, Benito Jones is definitely someone who you can see, but he's not really a three-down defensive lineman. Um, so they did bring in Malik McDowell, um, and I I would absolutely love if the Dolphins signed him. Um, we'll see. Um, you know, there are a lot of defensive tackles out there on the market, but there's something exciting about Malik McDowell. I just remember watching some gameplay of him while he was at Michigan State, and, and he was he was exciting. You know, six foot six, three hundred pounds, athletic, explosive, strong, and sort of a physical the physical profile of Christian Wilkins. Frankly, just kind of a bigger more dominating presence you know he was raw high ceiling so you know he didn't share that with Christian Wilkins where Christian Wilkins was a lot more refined coming out of Clemson and you know motor was never a question but with with McDowell it has been you know he was taken 35th overall by Seattle in 2017 so you know the NFL has recognized his talent but unfortunately due to you know some off-field issues and you know an accident you know that he had um, and some legal issues he, he's never you know suited up in the NFL and, and played it down so you know, he is, you know, 24, 25 years old, you know, if he still possesses that same, you know, power and athleticism and he's in shape, yeah, bring him in. You know, he's strong at the point of attack. He, he's, he wasn't a sack specialist on the interior or necessarily elite in anything particular. He's just, you know, as a rotational piece, he would be amazing, you know, and, and if he is able to sort of become, you know, an Alden Smith type, where you come out of, you know, uh, you know, a place in your career where, you know, people have sort of le- le- left you out to dry and they don't expect anything from you and you're able to sort of get your life in order and come back and, and ball out. Why the hell not? And I think Miami's a great spot for that, considering where we are as a team um, and, and sort of in the arc of, of the franchise um, right now. He's been learning from Ryan Fitzpatrick, which is another bonus for two who's looking to throw. Chased in his own end zone and his first NFL pass is complete to Patrick Laird. Bama, a big comeback in the national title game when he entered on third down. He completes it to Jakeem Grant. And with that spot, that's going to be good for a Miami first down. 
And that'll do it for us here today. Uh, thank you so much for tuning into this edition of the Fins Pod. You know, really hoped you enjoyed it. You know, the Tua era has started, you know, and the pod will be here for the whole ride. So please, you know, stick with, with us. The infusion of hope and excitement um, that's happened to this fan base, you know, it's palpable. Um, on Twitter, um, just talking to Dolphins fans, you know, the, texting the fans I, uh, you know, I'm friends with, um, you know, just, you know, talking to family members. You can see it in the community, the way people are sort of buzzing. Um, there, there's absolutely, you know, a palpable feeling of excitement that Tua has brought. So regardless of what happens, you know, there, there will be, you know, some strong emotions behind it. So stick with us um, online and, and, and by subscribing to the show to get all the content that you need. Um, the Fins Pod, you know, it's available on all platforms, Spotify, Apple Music, Google Play, our iHeartRadio, um, as well as an audio version on YouTube. Um, continue the conversation with me and the other members, um, you know, of the site over at Twitter, on Instagram, at FinsPod. Um, and check out the site, you know, for news and content. That's Vincepod.com. Hope you have an amazing rest of your day, and please stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.